Okay, good evening. I see some of you had enough courage to come back, and uh, that's encouraging. Um, they stay away from my meetings by the thousands. Uh, and uh, I'm not uh, the most popular person. Um, as I said this morning, I, I like your singing. Uh, the uh, first uh, song was about the blood. This is going to be my first question. I'll let you hang on to that. Okay. Um, you know, we can, uh, we Christians, we speak in Christianese. And we know what we're talking about, but a lot of other people don't. And we need to communicate with them. Blood. What are you talking about? Blood. Uh, uh, bloody religion, what, uh, you know, cleansed in the blood, power in the blood. I mean, wh wh what is this? Somebody about ready to run out of here. They never were in a place like this. <laughs> they never heard anything like that. Well, this morning we talked about be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks a reason. Uh, first of all, Christ could not be stoned. Now, you know your Bible. You know one of the evidences of when he was born. You, you understand Jesus was not born at zero. Uh, that's not, they, they, they've got a mistake in the calendar. Uh, he was born, well, I won't go into that. If you, you want to, uh, if you don't get our newsletter, the Brian Call, you're welcome to sign up for it at the book table. And we send it out for each month. We also have a daily email, believe it or not. And uh, you can ask us any question you want. Um, I'm not going to give the answer this evening to the questions. I won't presume to be the Bible answer man. Uh, I'll give you a response, which is my idea of the answer. But then you have to check it out. That's why we call our ministry the Brian Call. The Brians were no more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. So I'm not your guru. <laughs> You're not my followers. You must check me out because the Bereans checked Paul out. How about that? Then you ought to check everybody out. Billy Graham, check him out. Check the Pope out. Well, you know, <laughs> you don't have to check too hard, but it might... It, the very fact that he's a pope is a real, real problem. Uh, and the fact that he does not know whether he will get to heaven or not. Uh, I quote uh, often um, the former Cardinal O'Connor, the cardinal at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. He was quoted in the New York Times saying, the pope does not know whether he will get to heaven. Mother Teresa does not know whether she will get to heaven. I've been really criticized for what I've said about Mother Teresa in the past. Well, maybe I was ahead of my times. But I document it very thoroughly. Mother Teresa, you, you, want to, you could get a book, uh, not written by a Christian as far as I know, a medical doctor living in, in, in London uh, who grew up in Calcutta. It's called Mother Teresa, The Final Verdict. Okay, he gives you plenty of information. They've just published the letters of Mother Teresa. Wow, her father confessor, whom she made promise that he wouldn't publish them, and he did. Uh, maybe he thought it would help her get sainthood, be voted in as a saint because of all her doubts. She didn't know whether God existed or not. Uh, there's no hope, really, in, in Catholicism. Um, but uh, anyway, we're going to search the scriptures and, and find the truth. And uh, so you can check the Pope out. We'll give you plenty of information about that. Uh, now, the blood. What about the blood? Well, he couldn't be stoned because without, the Bible says it, look, he, look, Jesus didn't step off of a UFO and say, voila, here I am, worship me. 
Uh, he comes as the fulfillment of prophecy. Why is 70% of the pages of this book are about Israel? Why? Why is Israel so important? Because this is his genealogy. He is a Jew. He comes in fulfillment of what the Israeli pro prophets had to say. You can't escape it. This is how Paul preached the gospel. We've forgotten that. Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I'm an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Can you finish that verse? Which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus of Nazareth, and so forth. How do I know that the Bible is true? How do I know that, that the gospel that I preach is true? Because it's a fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies. And you won't find that anywhere uh, in any, any religion. There are no prophecies in the Quran. There's no prophecies in the Hindu Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata, you, know, you name them. No prophecies in, in, in any of these. No prophecies in the sayings of Buddha and Confucius. The Bible is full of prophecy. And it proves who Jesus Christ is. It, it proves it. There's no question about it. Uh, now, the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Uh, this was foretold in the Old Testament. You're not going to have any blood, not much of it. This is why we talk about kosher. The blood has to be shed. Why? Because the Bible said the life of the flesh is in the blood. Remember? They drained the blood out of, out of Washington's veins because in those days they thought that would get the disease out of you. And they killed him. Uh, his Bible was sitting right there beside his bed. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you upon the altar. That life is poured out. Jesus is not bleeding anymore. You understand? He has five wounds, you know. And he's not bleeding from those wounds. He lives in the power of a new life, an endless life. He's the firstborn of a new creation. And we will be in eternity in his image. We will not have blood in our veins either, okay? Our resurrected bodies because we will have another kind of life. All right? Sin is associated with this old flesh and the, and the blood and so forth. I won't go into a long discourse about that. But it all hangs together. And then we had the Trinity in what we were seeing, and the pastor commented upon it. Why the Trinity? Uh, well, I don't want to take time on what I wanted to say this evening, but uh, let's take a little bit of time. Trinity, is that biblical? Of course it is. Well, I don't find the word Trinity in there. Well, but you have the teaching of the Trinity. Now, there are basically three basic concepts of God. Forget pan pantheism. Uh, everything is God. Well, then nothing is God. I mean, that, that's God, and this is God, and you're God, and I'm God. And to say God is meaningless. <laughs> that's really just another way of being an atheist. To say everything is God. What kind of a God is that? Uh, you can't call out to this God to help you because you're already God. Now, uh, if you're God, I, I'm, ooh, I'm getting out of this universe if I can. Uh, or if I'm God, you ought to get out too because uh, we, can't, we can't possibly do that. But anyway, so forgetting that, you have on the one end of the scale, you have polytheism. Now, many gods, the Greeks, the Romans, and so forth, now, you've got diversity, but you have no unity. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got diversity, but who's the head God? Who pulls this thing together? There, there's no unity in this concept. The gods of the Greeks and the Romans fought one another. They stole one another's wives. There's no peace in heaven. There can be no peace on earth. So you've got diversity and no unity. On the other end of the scale, uh, many Jews probably any most Orthodox Jews. Uh, well, uh, uh, Jehovah, he's only one, one God. Uh, and uh, Allah, the Muslims would say, 
Allah is just one God. I don't know, you're not aware of it, probably. But the Quran says, you believe in the Trinity, you go straight to hell. That's a good reason to believe in the Trinity. Uh, Sixteen times the Quran says, Allah is not a father and he has no son. And yet every trans Arabic translation of the Bible that I know of, and I don't think there's any, any others, they use Allah for God. And they say, oh, but Allah is a generic term for God, like God, like G-O-D in English and Bogue in Russian and Dios in Spanish and so forth. Not true. All right, let's try to fit this into the Bible. Allah. Sixteen times the Quran says, Allah is not a father and he has no son. All right, let's put Allah in John 3.16. For Allah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoops, you got problems right away. Allah is not a father and he has no son. How can you say Allah is the God of the Bible? Of course he's not the God of the Bible. He hates Jews, for one thing. Uh, the God of the Bible 203 times is called the God of Israel. Okay? All right, now, what about Christianity? Go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. I love the Bible. It's fantastic. You can't, you're not gonna, you can't escape the Bible. Um, but we need to know the Bible. And I confess I hardly know it at all. I've been studying it for more than 50 years. Well, se <laughs> nearly 70. Um, verse 4, this is the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. When you see Lord, all small caps, that's Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh, Jehovah, if you want to pronounce it that way. Yahweh, our God, that's Elohim. That is a plural form. El is the singular form of God. Beth El, house of God. Elohim is a plurality. You cannot escape it. All through the Old Testament, you have plurality and singularity when we're talking about God. A little later in Genesis, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Who is this us in this hour? Uh, you can't escape it. Okay. Yahweh, our Elohim, is one Yahweh. But the word one there is Echad. It means a unity. It does not mean a singularity. And the first place you will find that in the Bible is Genesis 2.24. And there God brought, he created Eve out of Adam's rib. He brought them two together. And it says the two became one flesh. Echad. Not a one singular. No, there's two of them together. And they became Echad, one flesh. Here, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, is a unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is taught all through the Bible. Now, why is that? Well, the Father didn't die for our sins on the cross. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And I'm, I'm not going to go into this further. But... Uh, Without, uh, you know, without the Trinity, you've got no salvation. Over and over and over, you have plurality and singularity in dealing. It's a mystery. Wait a minute, how does that work? Well, I don't want to get into a mystery, but uh, there was a book written many years ago. Dr. Wood, I forget his first name. I think it was called, yes, it was called The Secret of the Universe. I think I read it as a young boy in the 30s. You can imagine that. And uh, The Secret of the Universe. He said, look, if God is a triune being, and he's the creator of this universe, then we could reasonably expect to see his fingerprints somewhere in his creation. Well, let's take a look. Well, he says... The universe is made out of three things. Space, time, and matter. Well, that's interesting. Well, each one of them is divided into three. Space is divided into three. Length, breadth, and height. Now, it becomes a little more interesting because each one is, is um, 
separate and distinct, but each one is the whole. The width is not the length, and the length is not the height, but if you draw enough lines width-wise, or enough lines lengthwise, you take in all of space. Okay, well, that's a poor illustration, but we're beginning to see something. How about time? Well, time is divided into three also. Interesting. Past, present, and future. And now it becomes more interesting because two of them are invisible and one of them is visible. Father and the Holy Spirit are invisible. The Son is visible. God becomes visible in God. He is the express image. He is the visible manifestation of the triune God. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to go further into it. It gets a little more complicated. Um, uh, matter is energy, motion, and phenomena. Now I'm not even going to get into that. But anyway, uh, the Trinity is a teaching of the Word of God. And it is essential. You don't believe in the Trinity, you don't believe in the true God. You want to know the true God? If you don't believe in the God of Israel, 203 times he's called the God of Israel. You have a prejudice against Jews or against Israel. And we got people out there, the replacement theologians. They don't believe that Israel has any significance anymore. It's been replaced by the church. And as I said this morning, very embarrassing for God. 203 times he's called the God of Israel, and Israel doesn't exist anymore. What are we going to do with a God like that? And he says he will preserve these people. And three times they are called the apple of his eye, okay? Maybe we'll come back and talk a little more uh, about that. But anyway, so my topic this evening <laughs> is supposed to be, where do we go from here? <laughs> I, everything, the songs are too interesting. I can't avoid speaking about them just a little bit. Well, the next event, I believe, on the prophetic calendar, according to the Bible, is um, the rapture. Did I hear someone say that? The rapture. Now, that again is a controversial subject, the rapture. I believe the Bible teaches imminency. I believe... Christ could come at any moment. Uh, that there are no signs. The disciples asked Jesus for signs, and he gave them many signs. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquake, that's, you know. Uh, but that's for the second coming. There are no signs for the rapture. The rapture could happen at any moment. The scripture says, we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, from heaven. We're not looking for Antichrist, you see. If Antichrist had to come first, I could give you 15 at least reasons why imminency is the teaching of the Word of God. But we won't get into that this evening. But if there's some event, any event, that must happen before the rapture, then I'm not looking for Christ. Oh, you say, but the Antichrist has to come first. Well, then I'm not looking for Christ. I'm not even going to begin to look for Christ until Antichrist comes. Well, after Antichrist comes, then, then I can start looking for Christ. That's not the teaching of, of the Bible. What does the Bible say over and over? Well, uh, we could just take a few scriptures. Uh, I, I started to quote one, Philippians 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, or our conversation, however you want to translate it, is in heaven. From whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will change our vile bodies that they might be transformed into bodies like his. Now, I find some comfort in things that some of you young folks don't find much comfort in yet. Um, uh, I think of the hymn that says, These earthen vessels break the world itself grows old, but Christ our Lord our dust will take and freshly mold. He'll give these bodies vile a fashion like his own. He'll make the whole creation smile and hush its groan. I'm looking forward to that. But, but Paul says we're looking for him. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, 10, 11, around there, it says... You turn to God from idols, you Thessalonians. By the way, 
First and Second Thessalonians are the first two epistles we believe that Paul wrote. These are written to new Christians. He had only spent, read it in Acts 20, he had only spent three, three Sabbaths with them. Um, how many days is that? Well, he hadn't been there for, he hadn't been there 28 days, so he was there less than 28 days. He taught them everything. Read those epistles. You remember how I told you. I don't need to warn you about the Antichrist. I don't need to warn you about the day. You know it's coming like a thief in the night and so forth. He taught them almost, He taught them a whole lot more than a lot of Christians know. Who have maybe been Christians for 20, 30, so they say. And you don't even know what the Thessalonians knew? After three weeks? Shame on you. They must have had a hunger for the Word of God, and they must have believed it and absorbed it. But anyway, the point is, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and what? And to wait for His Son from heaven. If you went to Hebrews 9, 27, 28, it is appointed unto man once to die. It takes care of reincarnation. And after this, the judgment... Okay, and unto them that, what? Look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, we've had some, uh, some words here. Uh, our citizenship from whence also we look for our Savior. You're waiting uh, for the Lord from heaven. We're, we're looking and watching, expecting. Uh, what, what about... Titus 2, 3, 13. Looking for that blessed hope. Okay, what about uh, uh, Luke 17, like verse 35. Let your loins be girded about, your lights be burning, you're dressed, you're ready to go, and you are waiting for your Lord when he, when he comes. You open the door, you are ready for him. Okay, I could give you other verses. We don't have time. Over and over the Bible says we are watching, waiting, looking, expecting our Lord from heaven. Now, my dear friend of many, many years, Alan Golub, over here was playing the violin. He and his, his wife came and son came to meet my wife and, and me at the airport. When was that? Yesterday. Wow, time flies. Amazing. Uh, now, I don't think Alan and Marilyn were there a week ago scanning the skies to see if we're coming. I don't think they were there a month ago. That was, wasn't, doesn't make sense. Why were they there then? Because we had a schedule <laughs> from the airline. Uh, now, we don't have a schedule about exactly when the Lord is returning. Well, then, we're, we're supposed to be watching, waiting expecting that means he could come at any moment and blessed are those who when he returns he finds them watching and waiting okay i can give you other verses i think you get you get the point uh luke 17 26 through 37 what does it say as it was in the days of noah so it will be in the days of the son of man at his appearing what what was it an evil time but Jesus does not emphasize the evil. Notice what he emphasizes. It says they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They're buying and selling and building and planting. Wow, it sounds like prosperity. It sounds like a business as usual. I wrote a book uh, many years ago. It's out of print now. Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust. Anybody read that book? Anybody remembers it? <laughs> okay. Um, the first chapter was titled, A Contrary Scenario. Most of you are too young to remember those days. This was 19, I think I wrote it in 83. And I think Los Angeles had 80,000 unoccupied dwellings. They couldn't sell them. This, the popular books in the Christian bookstores, The Death of the Dollar. The, the, the coming international financial collapse. Uh, and then others about the Soviet invasion of Israel. And my first chapter was titled, A Contrary Scenario. 
I think interest rates were 23 percent, something like that. Wow. Uh, the, 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 all the pundits were prophesying, you're going to have a stock market crash that will make 1929 look like a Sunday school picnic. This thing is going down. And just on the basis of the Bible, I said, no, it's not. Reaganomics is going to work. This thing is going to turn around. Now, the, the Dow average was 700, around 700 that time. Now, if you had followed my advice, <laughs> Where is it now? Over 13,000, I think, or up or somewhere around there. Nobody could have believed it. From 700 to 13,000? Wow. That's the opposite of what... Why would I say that? Because it says when Jesus comes, it's going to be a time of seeming prosperity. They're buying and selling and building and planning. They're parting it up. They're marrying and giving in marriage and so forth. I don't see that, the point I'm trying to make is, I don't see that at the end of the Great Tribulation, when this world is practically destroyed, okay? No post-trib rapture. A post-trib rapture would be a classic non-event. There's nobody to rapture. It, it, all the Christians have been killed by Antichrist, if they were here. Well, there will be many who will turn to Christ during the Great Tribulation, and they will pay for it with their lives. That's what it says. You don't take the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. You don't bow down and worship his image. You are killed. And believe me, the world police can find you. We've got GPS now. They can read a newspaper over your, over your shoulder, and, and they'll know exactly where you are. They can locate you anywhere. Uh, they gave us an upgrade on a car in Europe. Uh, not too long ago, and um, I don't know exactly how my wife worked that out, but we didn't pay for it. But anyway, first time I'd ever had GPS on an auto. We were going somewhere we'd never been before. Just punch in the address. Instantly, Bambi knows where you are. Here comes this voice and says, go 100 yards straight ahead, turn to the right, you know. I mean, she knows where you are at every moment. And if you made a wrong turn, she has a nervous breakdown. Wait a minute. <laughs> go back, go back. <laughs> okay. Now, this is something that was foretold by the Bible. He can find you anywhere. You can't hide from the Antichrist. Okay, but now, blessed hope. Let's talk about a post-trib blessed hope. Well, if you can eat out of enough, you didn't take the mark of the beast, so you can't buy or sell. Uh, and you didn't bow down to worship, so the world police are after you. If you can run fast enough to keep and hide well enough to keep a step ahead of the world police, and you can eat out of enough garbage pails to keep body and soul together, blessed hope. <laughs> you're going to survive to the end of the Great Tribulation. Blessed hope. You're going to get raptured. I don't call that a blessed hope. Uh, it just doesn't fit. Blessed hope doesn't fit a post-trib rapture. You understand? I could give you a, um, a, a lot of other reasons. Now, First John chapter 3, John says, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. Why is that? Well, I don't think a post-trib rapture is going to purify you. Well, i got plenty of time to play around, and I'll get my life straightened out when the Antichrist comes, and then I know we're in the Great Tribulation, and i got seven years or whatever. No. He could come now. When you really believe that, that will have a purifying effect in your life, like nothing else can. Not even the threat of death. I remember as a boy, well, I would tremble when that preacher would lean over that pulpit and point that bony finger that seemed to be pointing right at me and saying, you can walk out of this gospel meeting tonight and step off a curb and get struck down and killed and you're in eternity. Well, it frightened me for a while, but then I noticed that not too many people went out of the gospel meeting, stepped off a curb, were struck down, <laughs> and so began to lose the fear, you know. <laughs> or even if you're diagnosed with cancer, you could get chemotherapy, switch to a high-fiber diet, well, you know, all these things. Not going to be gone instantly, but the rapture, you are gone, or you're left behind. 
instantly. And you don't know when that's going to be. So the Christ says uh, a couple of times, Matthew 24, 48 to 50, and Luke 12, 45 and 6, What and if that evil servant says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming? Well, if you believe in a post-trib rapture, you are saying, My Lord delayeth his coming. Until after Antichrist has been here, that we've gone through the Great Tribulation. Jesus says, that will breed evil. But the blessed hope, if you hope that he might be here at any moment, that will breed purity in your life. Well, I could give you some other, other reasons. But, you know, uh, they tell the story of a preacher asked the audience, how many of you would like to go to heaven? Everybody raised their hand, except one little boy sitting in the front row. Well, that concerned the preacher. So when the meeting was over, he sat down beside him and said, Say, don't you want to go to heaven? Well, yes, sir, I want to go to heaven. But I asked everyone that wanted to go to heaven to raise their hand. And you didn't raise your hand. Oh, but, sir, I thought you meant right now. Uh, see, heaven is the place everybody wants to go to, but not yet. Not yet. You know what Jesus said? I married a wife. I can't come. Well, Lord, we just retired. I just retired. We got that camper with that boat and the bicycles back there and the trail bikes. I, couldn't we at least see the U.S.? We've never been to Hawaii, Lord. And uh, we had that on our plans. Um, couldn't you wait until then? Uh, let us at least have the honeymoon. And the Lord is angry. He's anxious. He wants to have us there. And we're making all kinds of excuses. See, the problem is, with many of us, we're not really that anxious for the rapture because if it came, it would just ruin a lot of our plans. It would just interfere. I mean, we love earth more than heaven. There's going to be a wedding up there, you know, Revelation 19. Now, that's another reason for a pre-trib rapture because... Tribulation is going on down on earth, and there's a wedding up there. There's been a judgment seat of Christ, of course. And the bride is clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, how did the bride get up there? Now, the wedding is in heaven, folks. Revelation 19. How did the bride get up there? The rapture? No other explanation? Well, Zechariah 14, it says... When his feet touch the Mount of Olives, you know, and it splits, you know what it says? He brings all the saints from heaven with him. That's pointing to a pre-trib rapture at the end of the Great Tribulation. When he comes to rescue Israel, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. He's got all the saints with him. Jude tells you the same thing. Here comes the Lord with tens of thousands of his saints. How did, they get, how did they get up there? <laughs> they didn't climb up on ladders. They didn't go up in rocket ships or UFOs. The Lord took them the rapture. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm talking more about that than I intended to. You just cannot escape it. A post-trib rapture won't do it. Um, so I believe in a pre-trib rapture, I believe Christ could come at any moment. What about those left behind? Well, Tim LaHaye is a dear friend of mine. I've never read any of his Left Behind series. But uh, so uh, I, I presume that they're biblically accurate. But I can tell you about the world Left Behind. We talked about it this morning. They have rejected God. They've trampled on the blood of Christ. Uh, see, that's a problem with a deathbed conversion. Now, I'm not denying that there could be some. But... Uh, you wouldn't have Jesus all your life. You trashed him. You had no time for him. And suddenly, oh, you know you're going to go into eternity. Oh, okay, Jesus. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit suspect. I'm not saying that it couldn't be true. It could be true. But I wouldn't count on it. See, if you're sitting here and you think, well, I'll wait till I'm about ready to die. Uh... I wouldn't ever do that. Uh, you might die suddenly. 
We, my wife and I used to own, and, and I was the administrator of a convalescent hospital. I thought people, when they knew they were dying, they would really turn to the Lord. I can tell you, most of them just slipped off into eternity. Just the way they spent their lives, that was the way they died. There are some who turn to Christ at the last moment, but they're the exception, really. But you would think they wouldn't be the exception. Why couldn't, why is there no escape from hell? Because it's too late. Everybody would want to get out of hell. You'd make any promise to God. Get me out of here. I'll believe. Sorry. Too late for you to have an honest, calculated decision. You've lost that opportunity. Uh, God is not going to coerce anyone. Now, God has given all the evidence in the universe and in conscience that could ever be needed. We talked a bit about that this morning from science. Instead of God, they worship science. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They turned the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible beasts and birds and so forth. Um, Isaiah mocks them. God, through Isaiah, mocks them. Well, they cut down a tree. With part of it, they warmed themselves in a fire. They cooked their meat with, over the heat. Part of it. They picked their teeth with part of it. Uh, and then, with part of this tree, they fashioned a god. It's got eyes, but it can't see. Ears, it can't hear. Got feet, but it cannot move. You got to carry this thing wherever you want it to go. And you look to it for salvation. Isaiah says, those who make them are like unto them, these deaf and dumb blind idols. What fools! Well, that's what science has done. We don't have time to talk about it. Evolution? you got to be kidding. Uh, we're cousins to an octopus. I mean, this is what, the, this is what these guys uh, say. Well, I explained this morning. We have the same DNA, but we have the same DNA as plants. Not the same in detail, but the same as far as the alphabet is concerned. doesn't mean that I'm descended from plants. Uh, but anyway, we, we won't get on to that. Well, they flaunt their rebellion in God's face, remember? Uh, see if I have another quote that I didn't give you this morning. I guess I didn't bring it. But uh, one of the scientists I was going to quote this morning, he says, we take the, the constructs of science in spite of the, of the obvious stupidity of some of the, its conclusions. <clears throat> Remember, this is the man who said, we are materialists, and we have a materialistic mindset. We will not accept anything but matter. We will not allow a divine foot in the door. And all the evidence is there. You know, I, I kind of mocked him this morning. I shouldn't do that. My wife reproves me for that. Uh, are we alone, you know? Is there somebody out there? Well, you're looking for a message. You've got radio telescopes going out there, and that's another joke. We talked about it this morning. And we're trying to listen for some intelligent message out there. You've got it on the DNA right in front of you. <clears throat> we talked about it this morning, remember? The, if you put the inf this is an information age we live in. IT, I was... One of the men the Lord led me to, my wife happened to be with me, and that's not easy to like, because nobody can sit next to me. Uh, and he was in the seat in front, and you're talking between the seats. An IT manager from a large mining company in Canada. We had a wonderful time. He didn't know whether God existed or not. And uh, we had a, a good, good conversation. And I've sent him some material, which he asked for. One of the books that sold out out there is seeking and finding God. He said, yes, I'd like to have a copy of that. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote that for myself to give to people, not to force on people, but someone like this man. I've discussed it, and he's interested. I got a book to give him. Uh, well, IT, what does that mean? Um, information technology, he's the... Uh, oh, come on, give me the... He's the, he's the IT manager uh, for this company. If you want to get into a growing field, get into information. 
Well, when I see information, I don't care if it's in a book, <clears throat> I don't care if it comes over the airwaves or I, word someone is speaking on TV, you see information, what do you know? It came from an intelligence, right? Oh, look, look, here's information on the page of the Bible. It's written in ink on paper. Did the ink or the paper originate the information? Of course not. A mind, a mind beyond our comprehension. Remember I said a pinhead's worth of DNA, the information on that? You put it in words, it's, it's written in words. It's encoded, in fact. It takes certain protein molecules to decode it. There's a good chicken and the egg. I, in this book, I give you a bunch of chicken and eggs. What came first, the chicken or the egg? That's not a joke. It takes DNA to create protein. But DNA is made out of protein. <laughs> now, what came first, the protein that the DNA is made out of or the DNA that must exist in order to create protein? Now, you got some real problems. For, for these people. But anyway, <clears throat> I see information on a page. It tells me it was put there by a mind and intelligence. There is no other way. Even Einstein, he certainly was not a believer in the God that we believe in, but even Einstein said, matter cannot arrange itself into information. How's it going to arrange itself into information? And when you find out about the information that's in the DNA, I mean, you couldn't possibly uh, be an atheist. Okay, now, we're, we're, we're listening. Well, could there be someone out there? I'm sorry, I shouldn't use this language, you idiots. It's right staring you in the face on the DNA. Information encoded in a language, it's words. It tells the, that little tiny single cell how to build a body with a hundred trillion cell, cells and how each of them is going to be operated. This is the construction and operating manual for a body. <coughs> Pardon me. And there is no life without these words, okay? We talked about that this morning. Well, we talked about anti-Semitism this morning. Men are defying God. Now, you could Google this. Uh, check me out. I think 14 million Jews on the face of this earth. And I believe, as I recall, 178 Nobel Prize winners, physics and chemistry and medicine and so forth, for 14 million Jews. 1.4 billion Muslims, 100 times as many. And they've got, I think, 10 Nobel Prizes. And nine of them are for peace. Now that's a joke. Uh, well, all, I, all I'm, I'm not trying to put the, anybody down. All I'm saying is Hitler killed his brains. The smartest people he had were the Jews. And he threw them in the ovens. And still, they lead the world in brains. Nobel Prizes and so forth. Well, maybe you don't like that. You don't like that. Seventy percent of the pages of this book are about Israel. And why is this so important? Well, we already mentioned it. The Messiah is a Jew. Without Israel, you don't have a Messiah. Why is this? Because we have proof. We have prophecies. We have genealogy. We even have, we've got the genealogy there. How's Christ going to, how's the Messiah going to get to earth? He, as I said, he's not going to step off of UFO. He is a real man. He is born of a virgin. He is God manifest in the flesh. But he has a mother. And he has a line of descent. He's descended from David. He's going to occupy the throne of David. Okay. So that's why 70% of the pages of the Bible are about Israel. Okay. Wow, i got to move along here. Now, I mentioned this morning, I'm writing a book, I'm writing three books at the moment, but a couple of them are, one of them is done, the second one is almost finished, but the really tough one is Cosmos, Creator, and Human Destiny. Pray for me. I don't have a degree of astrophysics or astronomy or biochemistry, uh, genet genetics or anything. I'm taking these guys on. 
They got PhDs in this. This is their life. I want to take them on, okay? So to do that, I have to read and absorb scores and scores of books or DVDs of their writings and of their thing. I've got to know how they think. And I also read the same for the creationists. I've got to know, well, what are their arguments? And I can tell you, I have been shocked because the absolute proof, I've never found a creationist who even mentions it. And so I have a title, a chapter in the book is titled, The Irrefutable Absolute Proof for Everything. <laughs> okay? <laughs> what is it? Prophecy. Prophecy. Whoa, wait, a prophecy? How's that going to prove anything? Okay, well, let's, let's look at some prophecies. Now, first of all, if we went to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Listen, this is what God... You want to know how God proves his existence? Prophecy. Oh, yes, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, but they can argue about that. You can't argue about prophecy. What does God say? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Prove it. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I give you dozens of verses, but we don't have time for them. But go back to verse uh, chapter 42. Verse 9. Behold, the former things are come to pass. New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God says, I will tell you what's going to happen before it happens. I will watch over history to make certain that it does. And when what I have said would happen, happens, you will have to acknowledge that I am the true God and this is my word. This is the proof God gives. And the creationists never touch it. They argue scientifically. Well, I can argue scientifically. Uh, I argue scientifically for, I don't know how many, maybe 20 chapters, and then suddenly I hit them. The overlooked, irrefutable proof for everything. <laughs> hey, guys, <laughs> I can prove God exists. I can prove that the Bible is his word. How? Well, he gave us the proof. Uh, prophecy. Hundreds of them. I'll tell you what's going to happen before it happens. Uh, look at chapter 43. Ye are my witnesses. He's talking to Israel. Saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand, I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. He says to the Jews, you're my witnesses, that I'm the true God. How? We got 144,000 godly Jews running around the world and proclaiming that Yahweh, Jehovah, is the true God. No, they're not trying to convert anybody. Most of them don't even believe this. How are they his witnesses? Because of what he said what happened to them. Everything that has happened to Israel, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, has been fulfilled. And God says, you are my witnesses. Why do I believe in God? The Jew, Israel. Uh, look, this book, well, it's all sold out, but you can get it from Amazon.com or whatever. Um, but... Uh, in the, in the first page, well, before I get to that, it's endorsed by Shimon Aram. It's okay. Somebody's card. That's probably important. I need to get that. But anyway, afterwards, I can't bend over like that. Uh, one of my dear friends, uh, one of Israel's most highly celebrated retired generals, uh, and he gives a fantastic endorsement of this book, but listen to what he says. In 1948, when the state of Israel was just reestablished, 600,000 Israelis faced 80 million Arabs. Wow. 600,000 farmers in kibbutzim. They're facing 80 million Arabs surrounding them who are sworn to exterminate them. 60,000 ill-trained and ill-equipped Israeli soldiers of a newly organized army six months old. Well, he ought to know. He trained them. Uh, crushed 600,000, a ratio of 1 to 10. 60,000, most of these Israeli soldiers didn't even have weapons. The United States would not sell them to them. They had to smuggle them out of Czechoslovakia 
Okay. Now, when you go to Psalm 124, what does it say? A prophecy, amazing prophecy. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, had it not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, they had swallowed us up quick. You want to get Madinajad, I guess is the proper pronunciation, who says Israel must be wiped off the map, the president of Iran? That's a joke. I challenge you. Travel the world, try to find one Arab map that has Israel on it. Israel doesn't exist. They have already wiped Israel off the map. And they're determined to make it true uh, in, in practical terms. Okay, so, and he was not the first, and we documented that for you this morning. Crushed 600,000, a ratio of 1 in to 10. Soldiers of four Arab armies. Well-trained, heavily armed, reinforced by units from seven additional Arab countries, not to mention the active help of the British. Shame and humiliation overwhelmed the whole Islamic world. Now, I begin this book, the very first page. I say, the stage is set, chapter one. The conflict between tiny Israel and the vast coalition of Arab Muslim nations arrayed against her is without question the most dangerous situation facing the world today. It is also the major subject of the Bible, in which are recorded in detail 2,000 to 3,000 years before they occurred the events leading to today's Middle East debacle. Furthermore, a fact to which political and religious world leaders surprisingly pay little attention, the Bible not only foretold the tragedy in detail, but declared its outcome. The consequences of this fact are logical and obvious. If the Bible is in error concerning Israel, all these prophecies, if any prophecy concerning Israel is not true, it's the major subject of, of the Bible, then all the synagogues and Christian churches that claim to base their beliefs upon those scriptures ought to admit that fact and shut their doors. Look, why, why should we be here if this book has false prophecies in it? It says things that never came to pass that aren't true. But... I go on. If, however, the Bible is true, and we can prove it, then the nations of the world ought to govern their conduct accordingly. For if they do not, the consequences will be disastrous. The following pages throw out this challenge to the world. Now, please get this book in your local library, okay? People need this information. All right, now, God proves he's the God of Israel. He's the God of the Bible by writing in the Bible things that would happen. Let me give you just a few irrefutable prophecies. I could give you hundreds. It's just a sample. Jeremiah 23, 7. Can we turn there fast enough? We have a, something called replacement theology, remember? Out there? Uh, D. James Kennedy, who just went to be with the Lord, I, I presume. Uh, evangelism explosion. I think he was a real Christian. But what did he say? Let me read what he said. His school, Calvin Knox Seminary in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He was the founder, chancellor, president, professor of evangelism. They wrote some years ago, not too many years, a few years ago, an open letter to evangelicals and other interested parties. The people of God, the land of Israel, and the impartiality of the gospel. And section 6 says... The inheritance promises that God gave to Abraham do not apply to any particular ethnic group, but to the church of Jesus Christ, the true Israel. I'm sorry, you've you got to have holes in your head. What, what Bible are they reading? I mean, it, it is very, very clear. But listen, it gets even worse. Section 9, the entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called the Holy Land cannot be supported by Scripture. What? That's what it's about. In fact, the land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament were fulfilled under Joshua. What? Joshua died at the age of 110. The Bible says these are everlasting promises, an everlasting covenant. Bear it in mind, because I have given this land to my people. This is my land. I've given it to my people. It's not to be sold, not to be traded. And woe to those who, uh, who uh, stand in the way of these prophecies being fulfilled. Well, now, let me 
give you just, we, we turn to Jeremiah 23, verse 7. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Not that it isn't true, it is, it's still history, but that's not the big news. What is the big news? But this is what it will be. The Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Some of you have been to Israel. A pastor goes there frequently. They have come back to Israel from more than 100 countries. That did not happen in the days of Joshua. Okay? What happened in the days of Joshua? Oh, they came out of Israel and came back. Yeah, that's, that's old stuff. What will be the big news, the headlines is, Blessed be the Lord who brought his people from all the lands where he had scattered them. They hadn't even been scattered in the days of Joshua. They just came back from one place, Egypt. Okay? Irrefutable prophecy. That's all I'm saying. Nobody can deny this. You cannot, ar you cannot argue with it. Well, you can argue, but you're, you're going to lose the argument. I mean, it isn't even an argument. You can't even begin. Now, Zechariah. Turn to Zechariah, chapter 12. I'm just going to quickly give you some prophecies to tell you where we're going. We're heading for Armageddon. Zechariah 12, and verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem... God uses that term. This is something he's doing. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, a source of fear, unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. That's a remarkable prophecy. Israel had many enemies. They're all, their neighbors were their enemies. Yeah, but individually, they fought one another. They had different religions. And the, God is saying the day is coming all of the neighbors surrounding Israel will be united in a common purpose to wipe out Israel. Go to Psalm 83. We won't take time to turn to them. They have said, we will make the name of Israel to cease to exist. That's what Ahmadinejad has been saying. That's what I gave you the quotations this morning. This is what the Arab world has been saying, the Muslims have been saying for centuries. Okay, this is what Muhammad said. Every Jew must be wiped out before any Muslim can be resurrected. God says, There's going to be, they will all be united. They, they used to be enemies. They used to fight one another. The day is coming when all the neighbors around Jerusalem will be united against Israel. Okay, is that a fulfillment of prophecy? Can anybody debate that? You can't argue that. Well, let's discuss it. There's nothing to discuss, folks. It's a fact. It happened. It's been fulfilled. Go to verse 3. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Okay, it's going to be a burdensome stone for all people. Wait a minute. There must be some kind of an arrangement uh, that all people are united. Not just the neighbors. Oh, we've got something. Whoops. We've got something called the United Nations. That would have to be in place for this full, to be fulfilled. What is the number one problem the United Nations faces? Israel. You can't deny it. It's in the news. Jerusalem. Israel. Israel has one one-thousandth of the Earth's population. The United Nations has spent one-third of its time debating, pronouncing, condemning, and so forth about this little nation that has one one-thousandth of the earth's population. Is that a fulfillment of prophecy? You cannot deny it. It's the number one problem that the nations of this world face. Well, I'm going to try to leave a little time for Q&A if you don't mind staying at least till 8 o'clock. It's not too late, is it? Whoops. Uh, but... I'm, I'm not going to let you go away without some, some more prophecies. Uh, go to Joel chapter 3. And there are hundreds of these. I just have to select a few. Joel chapter 3, verse 2. These are scriptures you all ought to know. Notice what God says. God is speaking through his prophet. 
I will also gather all nations. Now, if I'm speaking in Australia, people say, is Australia in prophecy? In the United States. Is, is the United States in prophecy? You better believe it. We just read it. All nations. Does that include the United States? I think it must. United Stations, beware. You are in prophecy. And you are courting the judgment of God. And President Bush, he's not the only one, but claims to be a Christian. Maybe he is. He's leading us into judgment. I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there. That means I'm going to punish them for my people and for my heritage, Israel. Who, two reasons. Two reasons God says I'm going to punish the nations of this world. Number one, they have scattered my people among the nations. They chased them. You can see it. Uh, chased from one country to another. We have some survivors here tonight. Chased from one country to another. You have scattered my people. Anti-Semitism. You have hated them. You've driven them out of their land. You've chased them from country to country. God says, I'm angry about that. I'm going to punish you for it. United States, I'm sorry. We document it. You need to get this. Get it in your library. Get, Google it or go to Amazon.com or get it from the Brian Call. Be happy to sell it to you. We document all of this over and over. And what's the next one? They parted my land. Now this is an amazing prophecy. No one can argue with this. The land of Israel was never divided. It's been conquered many times, but a conqueror doesn't divide the land. Why would he divide the land? He keeps it for himself. Today, first time in history. And I could go back and recite it. But again, we don't have time for that. The Balfour Declaration, 1917. The Declaration of Principles in, in, in uh, the, the um, League of Nations, predecessor of the UN, 1922. The whole world recognized that place called Palestine belonged to the Jews. And it was set, should be set aside for them. And Britain was given the mandate to see that the Jews were welcome back in there. By the way, where did this word Palestine come from? See, we got a problem over there. And again, we, I'm not trying to sell you a copy because we don't have any out there. But you need, to, you need to get it. You need to know the facts. Where does this word Palestine come from? See, the problem in the Middle East is we got some people called Palestinians. And they say, we're descended from Ishmael, the first son of Abraham. That land belongs to us. And these Jews are occupying our land. Have you heard about the occupied territories? It is a lie. It is a fraud. No, the Arabs are occupying Israel. And they're going to be punished for it. Uh, Palestine? This was the land of Israel. How did it become Palestine? 19, I'm sorry, 19. Uh, 150 A.D. The, the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. began to rebuild it as a pagan city dedicated to Jupiter. 132, they began to build a temple to Jupiter on Temple Mount. You think it upset the Jews? It upset them. There was an uprising. It was successful for a while. The Romans brought in more legions. They wiped out a thousand Jewish villages. They killed about a half a million Jews. They sold thousands into slavery. And in anger, the Romans renamed Israel Provincia Syria Palestina. I'm just giving you the facts of history. From that time on, everyone living there was called a Palestinian. Who lived there? Jews. You chase them out, they come back. This is our land. God gave it to us. Jews were called Palestinians. I quote, for example, in here, I quote a lot of Arab leaders. Here's Ahmed Shukari. I'll just name one. Ahmed Shukari, 1956. He is testifying before the United Nations. And he says, there is no such place as Palestine. If there's any Palestinians, we Arabs are not Palestinians. If there's any Palestinians, that's a Zionist invention. That's those Jews. That was 1956. Eight years later, 1964, Ahmed Shukari became the founding chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. They lie. They change history. They rewrite it. And what happens? The world accepts it. The United Nations accepts it. And this becomes the basis of a peace that the world is going to force on Israel. God says, I'm fed up with this. 
I'm going to punish you. You have divided my land. So what did Britain do? Well, 1944, 500,000 Hungarian Jews, untouched by the Nazis. Hitler needed money. He offered to sell them for $2 a piece. Nobody would take them, including the United States. Yeah, the United States is in on this. It's not just Hitler. It is the nations of the world who have the blood of the Jews on their hands. And God says, I'm going to bring all these nations. And I'm going to punish you. And I document in here how many times we have betrayed uh, Israel, the United, the United States that has. Wow. And they went to the ovens. Except Raul uh, rescued about 100,000 of them. Um, but God says, I am angry. Now, what, ha what finally happened? Britain kept the Jews out, Holocaust survivors and half-sinking ships driven back by the British Navy, put into camps. Britain lost its empire. Genesis 12, verse 3, God says, I will curse those who curse you. We used to talk about the British Empire in which the sun never sank. No, you can't say that anymore. They lost their empire over this. And then what happened? UN Resolution, Google it, look it up. Don't believe me. UN Resolution 181, November 29th, 1947. It is called the United Nations Partition of the Land of Israel. And the nations of the world joined to do exactly what God said they would do. They divided the land. And Israel ended up with 13% of what they'd been promised. And God says, I am furious. I can give you a lot of other prophecies, but I don't want to impinge on our Q&A time. Furious? Am I overstating it? Okay. Go to Ezekiel 38. I don't think I'm overstating it. By the way, let me give you just one more prophecy. Amazing prophecy. We won't take time to turn to it. Numbers 23.9. God says Israel will not be accounted among the nations. Israel has been a member of the United Nations for 50, more than, well, 50, nearly 60 years now. You got, I think, 101 nations, uh, member nations in the United Nations. 100 of them are allowed to take the rotating term on the Security Council. One nation is not allowed. I'll give you three guesses. Uh, we have a United Nations um, uh, Human Rights Commission, 50 members rotating. The only democracy in the Middle East, Israel, is not allowed on the Human Rights Commission of the UN. They will not be accounted among the nations, God says. Zimbabwe. Well, you know what's going on, Zim. Sudan. They've just been voted in for the third time. They've killed, the Muslims have killed more than two million in South Sudan. They're, they're on the UN uh, Human Rights Commission. Libya, I can name them. Cuba, terrorist nations, no democracy. Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, not allowed. Tell me why. Because there is a hatred for the Jews. Because Satan must destroy them. He must do away with, with, with Israel. Okay, well, but let's, let's, we're in Ezekiel 38 now. Let's take a quick look at it. What does God say? Verse 11, you're going to come up against the unwalled villages. I can tell you on the authority of the word of God, the wall that Israel is building is going to come down. The fence, the wall. Because it says... Verse 12, it's, you're going to come to the place, it's inhabited now, a people that are gathered out of the nations. We just said, well, more than 100, come from 100 nations. They're gathered out, and they're going to be dwelling there without walls and bars, because uh, Daniel 8.25 says the Antichrist with peace will destroy many. A false peace guaranteed by the Antichrist and Israel will be deceived. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name and you won't receive me. Another's going to come in his own name. Him you will receive. And Israel will be duped into accepting the Antichrist. Not all Jews, but many. And Israel will make a deal with him. Now notice verse 18. 
And it shall come to pass at this t- same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, my fury shall come up in my face. I said, God is furious. Wow. That makes me frightened. Well, I'm not going to be here when this happens, by God's grace. What does he say? In my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Listen to this. See, because I think your pastor here, I think he agrees with me. Very, very few of us who believe this is Armageddon. Most of the prophecy teachers say, oh no, this is a preliminary war. Uh, before the rapture, in the middle of the tribulation. This is not a preliminary event. This is the grand finale. Listen to what it says. I'm going to be furious. There will be a great shaking in the land of Israel, the fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep upon the earth. All the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. God is coming back to this earth. Ooh. Zechariah 12.10, they will look on me. This is Jehovah saying it, Yahweh. Yahweh says, they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Ask them, ask the Jew, when did your Yahweh get pierced? Ask the Jehovah's Witness, when did your Jehovah get pierced? And the word there is a piercing of the sword or spear in the side. It's not the hands, nails and hands and feet in, in Psalm 22. They will look on me, whom they have pierced. Suddenly Israel realizes the one that we have rejected all these years, this despised Christ, well, Messiah, he is God. God is speaking, you can't get away from it. They will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn because of him. Him, he and I are one. Jesus said, I and my father are one. You can't escape it. And all Israel will be saved. But sadly, two-thirds of them will have been killed. Uh, Zechariah 13 tells us. Now, if you go quickly as I can make it. Wow. Um, Go down to verse 7 of chapter 39. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. This is not a preliminary event. This is a grand finale. Even the fishes of the sea, everything is going to tremble at the presence of God. He comes back to this earth. This is frightening. This is the second coming. And Jesus Christ will reveal himself to Israel as God. Their Redeemer and all Israel, everyone who's alive at that time, will be saved. All Israel will be saved. Now notice what it says. They will not pollute my holy name again. Verse 7, go down to verse 22. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Wow, sounds like Israel has come to know God. They've come to know their Savior. Verse 29, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. This is the redemption of Israel. This is the second coming. You can't, you, you can't change it what it says. And if you went to verse 28, they will know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. I have gathered them out of their own land and have left none of them anymore there. This is a exciting. This is a miraculous event. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24. I'm going to send my angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they will gather my elect from the four winds to Israel. There will not be one Jew anywhere on the face of this earth who has not been gathered back to Israel. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Okay, well, when is it going to happen? Well, turn to Isaiah 66. And I'm just kind of glossing over an awful lot that is very important. But we have to do with what time we have, and I'm already taking too much time. Isaiah 66. Wow. Verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. What is the greatest travail Zion ever saw? The Holocaust. Without the Holocaust, the United Nations would not have had a momentary twinge of conscience 
and voted Israel to be to exist as a nation. It took some travail on, uh, on Zion's part, but at great cost. But as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now notice, shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? See, we, we fathers don't know, but we've seen it through our wives. Birthing is a process. It begins with, you know, uh, the mother-to-be. There's something going on in there. And uh, then pretty soon there's some kicks and, and so forth. And I can't describe it because it never happened to me. But it's a process. It gets worse. It becomes more intense. The labor becomes more frequent. And this is what Jesus said. He used that very language in Matthew 24. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, famine. It's going to be like travail of a woman in birth. This birthing is in process, he says. Israel's back in her land, but they got all these nations around them trying to destroy them. The birthing process, it's a travail. It is going on. And what does God say? Am I going to shut the womb? No. God says, I believe, when this birthing process begins, I'm not going to stop it until it is all fulfilled. I think that's where we are. I think we're heading for, first of all, the rapture. We're heading for Armageddon. Now, I don't know about each of you here uh, tonight, but if you're going to escape God's fury, you know, the Bible says God is angry with the, with the, with the sinner every day. He loves you, but he's angry. And how are you going to escape? Jesus took the penalty for your sins. There, there's, there's no other escape. You know, Jesus in the garden prayed. If it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Don't make me go through with this. If there's any other way that man can be saved, what was the answer? No. There's no other way. The penalty has to be paid, and you are the only one who can pay it. On the cross, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. How is the Father going to forgive them? He's going to have to punish the Son for their sins. Yeah, we can talk about that for a long time. It's a joint operation, Father and Son. We think about what Jesus suffered, what does the Father suffer? Give his Son to this, to man, to do this to him. So what do we know from the prayer of Jesus in the garden? We know there's no other way for salvation. The Father said, you are going to have to go through with this. You're going to have to pay the penalty for man's sins, or I cannot forgive anyone on a righteous basis. You know, Mary, you know, we were in, I, I think I must have offended some Catholics. I don't intend to do that. But we were in Spain, Holy Week, and uh, you got a parade. you got a coffin with glass on the side, and they're carrying the corpse of Jesus through the streets Friday afternoon well it's the wrong afternoon but we can't go into that but anyway uh, it should have been Thursday afternoon but anyway uh, I heard them comprendo poquito en español I speak enough, I understand enough Spanish to understand what they're saying and I heard with my own ears some of these people saying if you are going to die the time to die is between Friday evening and Sunday morning because Mary will get you in. Jesus is in the grave. If God lets anybody in on any other basis than what we sang about, the shed blood of Christ, the life of the flesh is in the blood. He, he paid the penalty for our sins. If he lets anybody in on any other basis, you couldn't trust anything else God said. It's a slap in the face to Jesus. Jesus could say, but Father, you said there's no other way. Why do I have to endure this? If there's some other way for people to get to heaven, why did I go through all this? Won't work, folks. I don't know what you think about this, but this is what the Bible says. And then when Jesus gave his spirit into his Father's hands, he cried with a loud voice, Tetelestai! In the King James, it says, it is finished. But that word in the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the Greek, they stamped it on promissory notes in that day. It meant paid in full. 
And if Jesus did not pay in full the penalty for your sins and mine, then we're going to have to finish the payment that he didn't make for us, throughout, and it will take us all eternity. The only way you can escape God's fury, his anger, and his judgment in the lake of fire is if you accept the payment that Jesus made on your behalf. It's that simple. If you don't accept it, okay, then you will pay for it throughout all eternity. There's, there's no other alternative. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we've tried to cover too much, but Father, I pray that it would really work uh, your will in every heart, mine included. And now, Father, as we uh, take just a, a, a little time for questions, um, we ask that you will guide us and show us what to say. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.